Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Saturday, 22 June 2024. It is the 257th anniversary of the birth of Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was born in Potsdam, then part of the Margraviate of Brandenburg on this day in 1767. Wilhelm von Humboldt is not to be confused with his younger brother, the explorer Alexander von Humboldt. Wilhelm von Humboldt was a philosopher, a linguist, and an educational reformer rather than explorer, but both brothers were honored in the foundation of the Humboldt University in Berlin. We don't typically think of Humboldt when we draw up the short list of Enlightenment thinkers, which would probably include names like Kant, Hume, Gibbon, Voltaire, Diderot, D'Alembert, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but we could well include Humboldt among them. Humboldt wrote a book called, or translated as, The Limits of State Action, which was published posthumously in 1852, and which was translated into English a couple of years later. And in this form, in its English language form, it exercised its influence on the Anglophone world indirectly by being a significant influence on John Stuart Mill's book, On Liberty, which we have since come to see as the locus classicus of the Enlightenment political paradigm. Mill took the epigraph for his book on liberty from this work by Humboldt, quoting this much of it. Quote, the grand leading principle toward which every argument hitherto unfolded in these pages directly converges is the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity, unquote. So here's a longer extract that gives more of the context of the point Humboldt was making, which includes the John Stuart Mill epigraph uh, within it. Quote, national education or that which is organized or enforced by the state is at least in many respects very questionable. The grand leading principle toward which every argument hitherto unfolded in these pages directly converges is the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity. But national education, since at least it presupposes the selection and appointment of some particular instructor, must always promote a definite form of development, however careful to avoid such an error." Unquote. So this shows us that the human development to which Mill appealed was set in the context of a discussion of education, which Humboldt understood to be the condition under which individual development takes place. In a recent newsletter, I argued that education was at the heart of civilization, since education is the vehicle by which the traditions of a civilization are passed from one generation to the next. So the continuity of any civilization is a function of its educational institutions, whether formal or informal, you could say. I'm not aware whether Humboldt explicitly formulated this connection between education and civilization, but we know he was an educational reformer and an influential one at that, and we know that he wrote about civilization, so he did entertain both ideas. Humboldt wrote a three-volume work uh, on the Kauai language, on the language of Java, on the island of Java, excuse me, the, the introduction to which was separately published as on language, the diversity of human language structure and its influence on the mental development of mankind. The introduction to this book on language is a remarkable meditation on culture, civilization, and cognitive development, among other things. And it includes, quote, where man appears, he acts in a human way, combines gregariously, creates organizations, gives himself laws, and where this has occurred in a more imperfect fashion, supervening in individuals or dynasties transport thither that what has succeeded better in other places. With the rise of man, therefore, the seed of civilization is also planted and grows as his experience evolves. Thus humanization, this humanization we can per perceive in advancing stages, Indeed, it lies partly in its own nature, partly in the extent to which it has already prospered and is further perfecting can hardly in essence be disturbed." Unquote. Here again, as with his remarks on education quoted earlier, we see a 
developmental conception, but is here applied to civilization, which is the same, which is at the same time a selective conception, as Humboldt is arguing that social institutions that have succeeded better elsewhere can be brought to a geographical region where these institutions were imperfect, and the more successful institutions will outcompete the native institutions. This was a generation before Darwin and the explicit formulation of natural selection as a mechanism of selection. And this developmental and selective understanding of social institutions explains in part what Humboldt was driving at in the following passage from the next section. Quote, civilization can come forth from within a people and testifies in that case to that uplifting of the spirit which cannot always be explained. If, on the other hand, it is implanted in a nation from without, it spreads more quickly and also perhaps penetrates into every branch of the social order, but does not react so energetically upon mind and character. It is a splendid privilege of our own day to carry civilization into the remotest corners of the earth, to couple this endeavor with every undertaking and to utilize power and means for the purpose, even apart from other ends. The operative principle here of universal humanity is an advance to which only our own age has truly ascended and all the great discoveries of recent centuries are working together to bring it to reality." Unquote. After Humboldt makes that argument, he talks about the discussion, he discusses um, the civil, the colonization efforts of the, the Greeks and the Romans in classical antiquity and finds it wanting in comparison to what has been done in the modern era in terms of, of dispersing civilization more widely. If we were to take this quote from Humboldt out of context, it would sound like a defense of imperialism. And I can easily imagine that there are many people today who would read it in this way, even with the full context supplied. As an enlightenment thinker, Humboldt was a true believer in universalism. And it follows from this universalism that what works better elsewhere should eventually spread until everyone has the benefit of these optimal institutions. We can find all kinds of problems with Humboldt's account of civilization if we want to if we want to look for them. For example, Humboldt wrote that civilization spreads more quickly when it is implanted from without in contradistinction from developing indigenously. From one point of view, the superficial spread of civilization can be more rapid than the long, slow developmental curve of a people creating these institutions from scratch. So Humboldt's claim sounds counterintuitive to me, but the argument certainly could be made for that. However, the rapid spread of civilization comes at a cost, as Humboldt acknowledges at the end of this paragraph, where he notes that the original individuality of a people who have had civilization implanted from without is nipped in the bud. We could also add that this kind of superficial development is shallow and doesn't run deep, which Humboldt already implied in, in, the, in the quote I read from it, it's uh, the implication that it doesn't sink very deep into the, the cognitive life of the people so influenced. Uh, as a consequence, I would also argue uh, a civilization imposed from without isn't going to be resilient because it doesn't have deep roots. So these and many other these and many other objections might be made to Humboldt's account of civilization. But what is of most interest here is that Humboldt's account of the origins of language and culture and civilization is completely naturalistic to a degree that is rarely seen at this point in time in history. In studying the languages of Java, Humboldt affirmed that quote. Java manifestly received higher civilization and culture from India, and both in a significant degree, but the indigenous language did not, for that reason, alter a form that was more imperfect and less adapted to the needs of thought. On the contrary, the needs of thought, on the contrary, it robbed the incomparably nobler Sanskrit of its own form to force it into the local one, and India itself however early it was civilized and not <clears throat> through foreign mediation, did not obtain its language from this, the principle thereof, profoundly created from the truest linguistic sense, flowed rather like that civilization itself 
from the gifted mentality of the people, unquote. It was rare at this time to recognize the independent origins of multiple civilizations, of one of which would be Indian civilization. Even today, with all the archaeological evidence we have, there are still people who argue for a, what I would call a hyperdiffusionism, in which civilization originates only once in one place and was subsequently dispersed to every inhabited geographical region. Humboldt is clearly making the case that Indian civilization had an indigenous development. And that's that's an unusual position to hold at the time and worth noting. And it's also an implicitly naturalistic position to recognize that civilizations, when the conditions are right, when the boundary conditions are met, you could say, uh, can spring up wherever and whenever, you could even say. Humboldt's writings on language, culture, and civilization are relevant to philosophy of history. But like his influence on John Stuart Mill, the influence of these writings is mostly indirect. Humboldt made at least one explicit contribution to historiography in an 1821 paper that was translated in history, as theory, history and theory as on the historian's task. Here is Humboldt's opening paragraph from that address. Quote, the historian's task is to present what actually happened. The more purely and completely he achieves this, the more perfectly he has solved his problem. A simple presentation is at the same time the primary indispensable condition of his work and the highest achievement he will be able to obtain. Regarded in this way, he seems to be merely receptive and reproductive, not himself active and creative, unquote. Even while asserting that the historian must be guided by ideas, Humboldt warns his audience against an overtly uh, philosophical approach to history. Quote, the understanding of events must be guided by ideas. It is, of course, self-evident that these ideas emerge from the mass of events themselves, or to be more precise, originate in the mind through contemplation of these events undertaken in a truly historical spirit. The ideas are not borrowed by history like an alien addition, a mistake so easily made by so-called philosophical history. Historical truth is, generally speaking, much more threatened by philosophical than by artistic handling, since the latter is at least accustomed to granting freedom to its subject matter. Philosophy dis dictates a goal to events. This search for final causes, even though it may de be deduced from the essence of man and nature itself, distorts and falsifies every independent judgment of the characteristic working of forces." Unquote. This reminds me of Jakob Burkhardt's repudiation of philosophy of history. Burkhardt wrote, quote, above all, we have nothing to do with the philosophy of history. The philosophy of history is a centaur, a contradiction in terms, for history coordinates and hence is unphilosophical, while philosophy subordinates and hence is unhistorical." Unquote. Perhaps in Humboldt and definitely in Burkhart, these pro forma disavowals of philosophy of history are intended to distance the authors from speculative or substantive philosophy of history, which is uh, treated as though it were the only kind of philosophy of history. Both Humboldt and Burkhart have much to say that could be taken to contribute to analytical philosophy of history, at least in an inchoate form. Perhaps a better comparison than Burkhart would be Jeffrey Elton's criticism of what he called thesis-driven history, or what Georg Zimmel called extra theoretical interest in history. But historians are always on the, the lookout for writers imposing an agenda upon history. In his 1950 presidential address to the American Historical Society, Samuel Eliot Morrison noted Humboldt's anticipation of Ronca's vias eigentlich gewesen dictum. Quote, I stand firm on the oft-quoted sentence of Leopold von Ronke, which we American historians remember when we have forgotten all the rest of our German. The present investigation, said Ronke in the preface to his first volume, published in 1824, will simply explain the event exactly as it happened. Ronke was far from being the first to say that. 
He picked up the phrase, I imagine, from Wilhelm von Humboldt, who, in an address to the Prussian Academy three years earlier, declared the proper function of history to be the exposition of what has happened, unquote. Yesterday in my episode on Reinhold Niebuhr, I also mentioned another saying of Ronke, the idea that all ages are equidistant from eternity. But since I haven't yet recorded an episode on Ronke, I'm going to pause a moment to explain a little bit more about his influence. If you haven't read much historiography or philosophy of history, it's possible that you've never heard the name of Leopold von Ronke. But as soon as you open up a book on historiography, you'll find that Ronke is a dominating presence. Ronke wrote a lot of works on history. It was primarily his influence on his pupils, however, that secured his influence and his professionalization of the field of history. He wrote a few occasional remarks about that reflected on his work as a historian, um, but these few remarks have proved to be disproportionately influential. Most of all, it was the phrase uh, quoted above, V.S. Eigentlich Gewesen, the full sentence of which translated into his English is this, quote, people have given history the function of judging the past to serve the world for the instruction of years to come, but nothing beyond the present investigation will be attempted here. It will simply explain the event exactly as it happened, unquote. V.S. Eigentlich Gewesen became an unlikely slogan among historians, and it has been translated in many different ways, such as the way it really was, or how it really was, or how it actually was, or the above uh, version of the event exactly as it happened. So insofar as Humboldt was understood to be anticipating this dictum of Ronke, his contribution is deemed significant simply because of Ronke's influence. The passage from Humboldt referenced by Morrison in that quote, was quoted in Benedetto Croce's History as the Story of Liberty, in which Croce comes, goes to some length to credit Humboldt with the origin of several ideas about history that Croce himself would further develop and call historias, historicism. But as we've seen in several episodes, everybody has their own definition of historicism. So you have to explain what you mean when you talk about it. So here is some of Croce's exposition of Humboldt. Quote, in 1821, Wilhelm von Humboldt read a paper at the Prussian Academy upon the office of the historian, in the course of which he rejected the philosophy of history and insisted on the point that ideas in history must come from the very plenitude of events, which is just as true in, as the universe is, which is just as true as the inverse is, excuse me, and declared that the history of the world is unintelligible without a government of the world, which is vague thinking. Yet survivor as he was of the great age, which was just then closing, he aspired toward the function, toward the fusion of ideas with events as the artist does in the poetic image. And he was aware and fully conscious of the many difficulties which had to be overcome here. Those who followed on him made of these provisional and groping propositions a definite doctrine and of this perplexed and, and of his perplexed and cautious start a halting place. Ronke was of this number. Humboldt had said that the proper function of historiography is the exposition of what has happened and fulfills its task the more perfectly as the exposition is more complete and satisfying. And Ronke en echoed that history has no other aim than simply to explain the event exactly as it happened without taking the trouble to demonstrate the origin or the nature of the affirmation of the historical event. Humboldt had raised the problem of ideas in history, though he had not defined it nor incorporated it into a system of philosophy of the spirit and of ideas. Ronke always spoke of these ideas or tendencies of various epochs, but he did not allow himself or anyone else ever to go so far as to define them or elaborate them as concepts. He insisted that they could only be intuited by seeing them in an event, unquote. So that was Croce's interpretation of Humboldt's uh, character, characterization of the historian's task. And historian Humboldt concludes his paper on the historian's class task with this reflection, quote, there are two things which the course of this inquiry has attempted to keep firmly in mind, that there is an idea, 
not itself directly perceptible in everything that happens, but that this idea can be recognized only in the events themselves. The historian must, therefore, not exclude the power of the idea from his presentation by seeking everything exclusively in his material sources. He must at least leave room for the activity of the idea. Going beyond that, moreover, he must be spiritually receptive to the idea and actively open to perceiving and appropriating it. Above all, he must take great care not to attribute to reality arbitrarily created ideas of his own and not to sacrifice any of the living richness of the parts in his search for the coherent pattern of the whole. This freedom and subtlety of approach must become so much a part of his nature that he will bring them to bear on the investigation of every event. For no event is separated completely from the general nexus of things, and part of every occurrence lies beyond the pale of direct perception, as we have shown above. If the historian lacks the, his freedom of approach, he cannot perceive events in their scope and depth. If he lacks subtlety intact, he will destroy their simple and living truth." Unquote. In an essay on Schiller, and Schiller himself was a philosophy of history, his, history, Humboldt wrote this, quote, Schiller used to say of the writer of history that after he had taken up into himself all the factual material by means, and exact, by means of exact and thorough study of the sources, he must build out of himself the collected material into a history. And Schiller was completely right in that, although his assertion could also be fundamentally misunderstood. A fact can be merely transcribed into a history as little as a fa fa facial expression of a human being into a portrait. As in organic structure and the expression of the, set of the soul in external form, there is a living unity within the interconnections of even a simple event. And it can be comprehended and represented only from this center outward. Also, whether intentionally or not, the conception of the historian steps between the event and its representation, and the true con connection of events will be recognized with most certainty by those who have exercised their vision on philosophical and poetic necessity. For here, too, reality stands in a mysterious bond with the mind." Unquote. Humboldt, Humboldt had already made a similar point in his 1821 paper, quote, one has, however, scarcely arrived at the skeleton of an event by a crude sorting out of what actually happened. What is so achieved is the necessary basis of history, its raw material, but not history itself. To stop here would be to sacrifice the actual inner truth, well-founded within the causal nexus for an outward, literal, and seeming truth. It would mean choosing actual error in order to escape the potential danger of error. The truth of any event is predicated on the addition mentioned above of the, that invisible part of every fact. And it is this part, therefore, which the historian has to add. Regarded in this way, he does become active, even creative, not by bringing forth that which does not have existence, but in giving shape by his own powers to that which by mere intuition he would not have perceived as it really was. Differently from the poet, but in a way similar to him, he must work the collected fragments into a whole." Unquote. So by the time we get to the substance of Humboldt's essay on the historian's task, it doesn't sound at all like Rilke's V.S. Eigenlich Gewissen. Humboldt starts out in a way that sounds like Ronke, but he develops the idea in a different direction. He presents a sorting out of what actually happened, uh, which he could, which we could call the way it actually was, following Ronke, but as a mere prelude to the true task of the historian. In drawing a distinction between a seeming truth of history and an actual inner truth of history, Humboldt is close to making a distinction between historical appearance and historical reality. In other words, he's very close to a metaphysics of history. So happy birthday, Wilhelm von Humboldt, and thanks for listening.